wanted to ask, start off with a question. I wanted to know if anyone knows what the time is. Yeah, you guessed it, it's a trick question. I think the honest answer to that is nobody really knows what the time is. So today I'm going to start off by uh, apologizing because I found out the reason why we all have to speak in English. It's because of me. Sorry about that. I apologize for being a monoglot. And uh, I'm not related to Steve Jobs either. I've just always had an affinity for black Polonex. So I would like to start off with a uh, precognition, actually. Let's get this uh, up and running. Which is that this, this presentation itself is open source. Um, you can actually, if you want to just follow along with the slides, you can go to the first link, it's the bit.ly link. And then if you want to actually see how I put the presentation together, all of my thoughts, a chronology of my thoughts, you can also go to the GitHub. It's a little bit brave on my part, I have to admit. Um, there is some embarrassing stuff in there, but I've been tracking my time and I've been journaling how I, I came about to, to give you what I'm giving you today. So I would like to progress then to talk a little bit where I'm coming from on this. So I like to start with first principles. I don't describe myself as a philosopher, but I love philosophy deeply. It's in my DNA. But really, I'm just a witness. I'm just someone that's here for the journey. And so today is just going to be me telling this from my point of view by way of giving you something to respond to. Now, I actually would like to inspire this talk with this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes of all time. Civilization is a race between education and catastrophe. And I hope to demonstrate to you why that is relevant as we progress through. Now, for some reason, I feel like the internet is this. Like, this is not what the internet was meant to be, but it has descended into kittens and babies. And a lot of people spend an awful lot of time, in fact, the young people especially, wake up every morning and the first thing they do is they go on Facebook. Now, for me, it's Twitter. But this is serious, and I'll tell you why it's serious. Because if you control the information in a system, you control the beliefs. And if you control the beliefs, you control the behavior. You control the actions. And it strikes me, and I'm following on from pretty much everyone that's, that's spoken so far, to really talk about the ethics. So, being someone who loves ancient Greece, and uh, being a big fan, I would say I need to start off with the Socratic dialogue, the what is it question. We need to ask ourselves, what is it? So the reason, the reason I'm into this is because my first, my first sort of uh, foray into cryptocurrencies was with a wonderful project called Feathercoin, of which I've since, you know, I've, I've gone on to other things, but I'm, I'm still very much um, connected to the project. Um, I still love what they did because it was just a, a small group of self-select people coming together in Oxford, England, and deciding to have some impact and deciding that they wanted to do something really cool with this, this tool as well. And I was very lucky to, to meet Rob, a.k.a. Uncle Muddy, on, on the forum. He was creating some open source hardware, which I don't think is getting enough representation at the moment um, in the public uh, 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 space. And he created this wonderful point of sale uh, using a 3D printer for the case and a Raspberry Pi for, for, for the underneath. And it just used something silly like 50 lines of Python code. Uh, that anyone could learn how to do with just a little bit of time and effort on their part. So I was very privileged to share my time with them. He open sourced all the plans. It's up there on the forum. In fact, uh, the, by the way, this uh, presentation itself is interactive. There's a lot of links uh, lying around in it, so please feel free to click and inquire. And one of the things that I was contributing to, I think a lot of people from the outside just thought that I was the promotions guy from the PR, and actually that, that offends me, because I, I did do a lot more than that. I was responsible for the community uh, engagement. I was tr you know, trying to get people energized and looking at the, the basic fundamentals. I was going out, I was doing videos with some of the users, getting them to use the software and getting actual feedback from people directly on the ground to see how well uh, that they were understanding it. And one of the things that I learned uh, in my time there was, well, one, money is already digital. It's been digitized now for at least 30 years. David Charm, I think, first wrote his paper in 1981. And so money was already digital, but the, actually it wasn't really the money people wanted. It was each other. Well, the, the money really, for me, just came across like an excuse. Like everyone talked about the price the whole time. Everyone was kind of obsessing and comparing notes. But actually it wasn't the money. It was where it took them. 
It was the things they could spend on it. It was their dreams. But that they would generally only make themselves vulnerable and talk about some of their aspirations in life if they were in a, a small, connected group. And a lot of people have criticised projects like Feathercoin, saying that it leads to redundancy in the, in the industry, that you end up with duplication of effort. But actually, one of the benefits of these types of uh, niche communities is that they tend to favour minority groups. If you are underrepresented more generally in the world, you'll tend to do better in a niche group of people because your voice is more likely to be heard. It's actually one of the hidden costs of democracy, which is that the larger the democracy gets, the less impact each individual voter can have because they represent a smaller percentage of the whole. And so I actually saw it as a, as a yes, I, I do agree with some of the criticisms um, about, about the duplication of effort, but I think there's a larger payoff that I don't think we're paying attention to, and it's a sociological payoff. And really, I think one of the biggest impacts that you can have in a small project like Feathercoins is that it gives people the ability to make a contribution. When you go to Bitcoin Talk Forum, or if you go to uh, github.com forward slash Bitcoin Bitcoin, one of the things you notice is how intimidating it is. There's a whole bunch of people that are way, way smarter than you, and everything feels very political, and you don't want to speak up. But we need those people to speak up, especially the ones that feel afraid, because often they've got the most relevant thing to say. So, first principles, what is it? I want to take you on a journey, go right back to the beginning in terms of Bitcoin, and this time I want to focus on a few things. So what is the goal? Satoshi is laying out an agenda, and he has to establish something. I'm speaking to an informed audience, so I believe I am, so please stop me if I'm skipping anything. Fundamentally, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a system where everyone plays by the same rules. And actually, that's diametrically opposed to the system that we currently have. The game at the moment is don't play the game unless you can cheat and then try to persuade everyone else to play by the rules. I want to draw your attention to the last line in the abstract. Nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will, accepting the longest proof of work chain as proof of what happened while they were gone. It bears repeating, so I'll say it again. In fact, I'll back up a little bit. Messages are sent on a best effort basis, recall HG Wells. Nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will, accepting the longest proof of work chain as proof of what happened while they were gone. See the painting? Anyone know what that painting is? So that painting is from about uh, 1943, it's right there. Um, and this is a Rockwell painting uh, called Freedom from Fear. Freedom from Fear is what the mind wants, what the mind needs. And I'd like to draw your attention to the newspaper. This has a lot to do with publishing. This has a lot to do with being heard because information science has been an industry in the making for at least 3,000 years. Now, what we're depicting here is the protection of the children by the concerned parents who are keeping an eye on things whilst they look the other way. We're saying, how can we create a system where when we look the other way, we can trust it to behave as we anticipated ahead of time. That was the goal. And we're going to do that, Satoshi claims, by creating something that he terms, very early on in the paper, as a distributed timestamp server. The way we're going to do it is by giving everyone a single history. Everyone needs to agree on a single order of events in such a way that cannot be disputed. And then my favorite part of the paper of all is section six, and it's to do with the incentive structure. And here, again, is how his proposal is going to be 180 degrees different to what we currently have. The incentive may help encourage nodes to stay honest. If greedy, if a greedy attacker is able to assemble more CPU power than all the honest nodes, he would have to choose between using it to, uh, to defraud people by stealing back his payments or using it to generate new coins. He ought to find it more profitable to play by the rules, such rules that favor him with more new coins than everyone else combined than to undermine the system and the validity of his own wealth. Notice the language. 
It's very different to the language in the rest of the paper. Anyone spot it? Anyone? It's the equivocation. He uses the word may and he uses the word ought. This is a very, very intelligent, deep thinking individual that is insecure about his own knowledge. And so he does not want to presume that the most fragile part of any security system is the human. And he doesn't want to make any assumptions about how people are going to behave in the future. And so he uses the equivocation, the incentive may help encourage nodes to stay honest. He ought to find it more profitable to play by the rules. This is important. This guy's humble, right? He's going to be humble in the face of ambition because remember, this is an ambitious claim that he's making. So now, the bit you've all been waiting for, the what is it question, because actually we haven't had it so far, I've noticed, uh, in the presentation. So I'm inspired by Vitalik Buterin. He's a genius, um, very deep thinker, very philosophical, and he's working on something called the Ethereum Project, and he put it better than I ever could. He describes Bitcoin as a state transition system. And I've also heard him say, and this is my favorite, Bitcoin is a distributed database with a state transition rule that is markedly different Whoop, that gives us this. The internet at the moment, like Facebook, Bitcoin, uh, sorry, Facebook, Google, you know, sites like this where it's all centralized and silos of information, what they do is they define their utility as you have not. You have not got the information, therefore you are not powerful. I can take the top level view, watch everyone inside of the system, and then create a kind of virtual reality that everyone has to take part in. Because whatever you see as the perception becomes your reality. If you control the information, you control the beliefs. Controlling the beliefs means controlling behavior. So this, I think, so far, is the best definition that we have. That Bitcoin is a distributed database with a state transition rule. And in database design, this is often referred to as the field called database ownership, or DBO. And when a database designer talks about DBO, he's not talking about the legal ownership. He's talking about the IT guy with the root password to the server that SSH is in at 3 in the morning when something goes wrong. Because if you have the ability to log in as root, then it doesn't matter if you've got the key, the whole key, and nothing but the key, which is something you often hear when they talk about third normal form in database design. Because if you can just go in and rewrite it, then what difference does it make? The problem is that in physics we have something called the law of conservation. And this is the idea that energy can't be created or destroyed. And the problem is that if your database doesn't describe the underlying nature of reality, then what's the point in the database? If all you're going to do is say, whoops, well, you know, we just need to print $16 trillion more, and then you want to go back and change what happened in the past, the problem is that your database isn't going to accurately describe the world. So what's the point in a database that isn't true anymore? So this is the, the fundamental difference. And also, I think, another difference is that this isn't really an innovation of technology, is it? Because there's nothing in Bitcoin that didn't exist as late as the late 90s, right? You've got RSA, you've got Merkle Roots, that was 1979, 1980. Then you've got PKI, you've got public key infrastructure, that's, what, 91 with Zimmerman and so on. So really, this could have been invented in the mid-90s and it would still work. This is a values innovation. That's what Bitcoin is. Essentially, you're taking available tools and you're just assembling them in a new order and then straight away, the most important feature of Bitcoin of all was that it was open source. The very first thing Satoshi does is actually write the code, not the paper, writes the code. And actually, I've also got a link in here. You can go to the Nakamoto Institute. I highly recommend you do. You can go back through all of Satoshi's uh, correspondence in, in the early days. So the first thing he does is he gets feedback. He doesn't raise money, doesn't do a crowd sale. The first thing is he gets feedback. Then he releases the white paper. Then he creates a forum, and people are able to iterate on the design. In fact, his code is famous for being not great. He was, he clearly, code was not his first language. And he required other people's help. But again, humble in the face of ambition, he persevered. 
So where does this take us? Well, I'd like to introduce you to one of my favorite things in the world right now. This is something called a Merkle tree. And if you've been watching me on YouTube, I'm on a, a YouTube channel called World Crypto Network. It's an open source uh, journalist rolling news channel. And we invite anyone to participate because we don't assume that our audience is there to be entertained. We assume that when you watch our videos that you are a participant, that you yourself are on the front line. The world is not Sky News, it's not CNN, it's not BBC 24. The world is where you are right now. And you are a witness. And you deserve to be heard. So anyone can tune in. We can create a, a video on YouTube and it gives us a little private link and then we can send you the link. And so long as you've got a phone and an internet connection, better if you've got a mic, better if you've got a fancy computer, but it's not required, you can tell us what's going on in your area. And the editorial controls are pretty minimal. Uh, basically, just be sane. Just be sane. We don't care. You don't have to be professional. Uh, we'll help you with that if we can. And one of the things that we've been doing is, well, so here's the thing. Here's the thing that bothers me, is that people just don't know what time is. And one of the ways that frauds are able to commit crimes is not by lying. In fact, actually, the first rule of fraud is never lie. What you do is you lie about the sequence of events. And the problem is that as the internet gets bigger, more content becomes available, which gives you more content to lie about. So for example, with MH17 and the crash, the first thing that happened was a PR offensive. The first thing that happened is everyone blamed everyone else. And then, of course, they needed supporting evidence to back up their claims. And there were plenty of images that they could get back from you know, 2012 and so on uh, with old, you know, old photographs and then you know, rework them in a different way and try to create a new theater, a hyper reality for you to walk into so that they could blame the other side. And since then, there's been a, it's a really good website I recommend called uh, Bellingcat, which is open source journalism that goes through all of that data and does fact checking and then produces a, an official report as to, you know, well, we, we put this image into Google image search and it turns out it's an image from Facebook in 2006. So that's not even a genuine you know, a genuine thing. But I was still interested and it struck me that we didn't really have good time stamping tools. So one of the things I started doing in, in the videos is I started to announce the block height. So one of the things that, that I do is I go to the Bitcoin clock and I read out the current block height. You can go to blockchain.info and you can, you can do as follows. It is block height, 330,730, Merkle root beginning, E, D, B, E, 1, 7, A, etc. What I've just done is I have embedded in the media of the recording of this presentation proof that I have knowledge of an event that I cannot have had any time prior to now. It is impossible for me to have anticipated this thing called a Merkle root. This is publicly broadcast, efficiently, symmetrically over space and time because remember that the blockchain is a distributed database so it, it spreads out pretty rapidly and every actor pretty much receives the information in real time no one actor is given asymmetric uh, or privileged access to that information another big big difference to the way that information currently flows so i'm proving that this video this audio this youtube video that i'm doing cannot have taken any time prior. And what I'm doing is I'm doing this on an iterative basis. So I keep doing this. And I form the basis of something called a Merkle root. And of course, there's links all over to this page. So if you want to learn more about it, and we're going to look at some code in, in a little bit to show you how you can make your own Merkle root. What it does is it creates an unbreakable chain of witnessed events, such that if you try to change one thing in that sequence, the whole thing breaks down. And this image here is actually used in the Ethereum white paper. And it demonstrates to you, I think quite nicely, uh, how this actually works, that you have uh, a series of, of uh, cryptographic hash functions. Does anyone know, not know what a cryptographic hash function is? Or a digest? Great, OK. Um, well, essentially, for, for anyone watching the YouTube video after this is finished, if you don't know what one is, it's basically uh, a pointer. It's a way of identifying a digital file byte by byte in such a way that if you change one thing about that file, the whole digest changes. 
So it can be used as an identifier and a, and a recognition of a digital, or a digital object. But also, and this is important, the formula that you use to generate the string of numbers and letters, you can see them in the boxes here, can be generated by anyone anywhere. So, so long as you have the formula, so in the case of Bitcoin, we use SHA-256, you can also download the same file, call up the, the SHA-256 algorithm, and produce the same hash. Doesn't matter where you are, it's distributed. And this is the reason why. This is why I'm a big fan of Taylor Swift. Anyone here a big fan of Taylor Swift? She's not just a pop singer. She's also a geek, an OPSEC philosopher. And she says, look, this is important because trust doesn't scale, because trust is not reducible to mathematics. And Plato would have loved this. He would have loved this philosophy because in the Republic, he was desperately looking for a system that could be reduced to mathematics because he says no one can disagree on a sum. No one disagrees that 2 plus 2 equals 4. But yet lots of people can agree all the time about who should run the military, who should you know, engage in what practices politically. So it would be better if we could do our politics using mathematics. And I think we're starting to vindicate Plato. I think we're starting to realize that vision. So trust is a very, very local phenomena. It's not something that automatically scales. Therefore, we need a trustless system. We need to be able to create a protocol and a series of instructions that anyone can agree with anytime, anywhere in the world. So let's take a look at some, some case studies. So this is a video that I did a couple of weeks ago. I have a, a YouTube show called Chris Before Coffee, which is currently on hiatus just because I've been busy with some other projects. And so this is an example. One of our reporters I want to give a big hat tip to. Together. And so they don't want to do that, so they don't want to go violent again. They've seen how the crowds have gone from 50,000 to hundreds of thousands when they use violence. So they have switched tactics, and they're trying to negotiate. Um, that's not working as well, obviously, because they're just being ignored. Everyone's still here. So I, I believe now they're moving on to another tactic, which is just to see how long will endure. Do you remember last night? Um, there were not people taking images of the protest. It was very serious, but as I said today, the mood has really changed. People want, they feel like they have to record, um, that they, they want to be a part of history, so they're taking selfies and a lot of uh, souvenir photos. Um, you know, it's no, today it's, it's not that serious protest mood, anti-police, anti-government, more like um, they want a historical record of themselves participating. That's really what it feels. As you can see, this guy right here, another selfie. Um, it's just been, I called it a selfie revolution today because it didn't feel like an umbrella it's revolution. Pervasive. Everyone has a camera now. Everyone's Well, let's timestamp this in the blockchain. So after this video is finished, I can upload this. And we are at block height 323,375, Merkle root beginning 7E094A. So that's it. I've just timestamped this video into the blockchain. Uh, there we go. Was that? Oh, that wasn't recording before. Okay, so this is where the timestamp went. It went onto a website called Crypto Graffiti, which is a <laughs> website where you control the blockchain. And this is where the the SHA two five six of that video went. Uh, so that timestamps it. Now, what that does is it locks the creation of that video into a very very narrow time frame of about ten to fifteen minutes. If I were to have doctored that video, I would have had about that amount of time in order to do it. I extremely unlikely. So I download the video as soon as we finish from YouTube, I create a hash, and then I upload it to the blockchain as soon as possible. And because I've put the Merkle root into the actual media, because I've read it out, I have proved that it didn't exist any time prior. By then taking the file, hashing it and putting it in the blockchain, I proved that it can't have been generated any time later, thus locking it into a sequence. And then what we usually do is we upload the videos to BitTorrent. We have a few people very generously around the world who offer to be seeds for us. And then we can put it into the blockchain forever and it's got the, the magnetic link there that you can just use to, to download. So even if YouTube were to take us offline, it wouldn't matter. You could still download the video and it would still be timestamped and you could still prove that that video existed in that condition at that time and no prior.
And this is uh, James in action. He's taken a lot of risks, actually. He's been really, really brave. One of his favorite things to do is to show the police how they're behaving in Hong Kong. So, and this is also a common motif throughout the protests in Hong Kong, is the, the use of mirrors. They, protesters have put mirrors up around the barricades so that the police can see themselves. Again, relating to my question earlier, this is about consciousness and the way consciousness relates to the necessity of nature. So I started to look for other potential use cases for, for some of these cryptographic primitives because my background is that I learned BASIC when I was about five and I learned some machine code and some assembly language. But then after that, I, I didn't really do a whole lot of code professionally. So went, since I've been introduced to, to Feathercoin and to Bitcoin, I've had to kind of play catch up. And so I was interested to see what other things that we could, we could do with it. And principally... This was one of the things I thought was missing in this, this whole industry, is I wanted to be able to create some of these tools using nothing but what's already publicly available. One of the things I find very frustrating at the moment is the first thing people want to do is put up a website, come up with a logo, come up with a brand name, and then do a crowd sale, rather than just putting it out there straight away. So I had this, this idea came to me about a world passport. I just find it ridiculous at the moment that two people can be born 50 miles away from each other. One has a world of opportunity and the other one is at the mercy of a tyrant. That doesn't make any sense to me. So I wanted to create a protocol using nothing but available tools, nothing that anyone can't just download off the internet in 10 minutes, such that one human being can prove the existence of another in space and time. That's it. That's all I wanted to do. And so I, I thought about this. The idea actually came to me whilst we were doing a live stream with someone called Suzanne Tempelhoff of, of BitNation, and she was saying how she, she wanted one of these things. So I went off and I, I thought about it. And the first thing I did is I, I published a, 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 a markdown file, a text file, essentially, onto to GitHub, and I put it forward. And then all of a sudden, Wired called me up, and they're saying, wow, this is, this is really impressive. We really like what you're doing. Uh, this was the... Uh, the picture that they, even, that they even published, which is amazing considering I use Comic Sans MS to um, do my sketch of what this thing might look like. I think it's pretty impressive that then Wired and then TechCrunch and, and everyone started. I didn't solicit any, any attention from journalists. And really all this was was, okay, what, what tools can we use given that we, that we know what these cryptographic digests are, given that we know how, how this unbreakable chain in, in a Merkle tree has, given that we have this distributed database that has the ability to prove publication in place, uh, sorry, in, in time. Was there any way we could do something called provable point of presence? That means can I prove that you existed in place? And I thought about it and I thought about it and I thought about it and then suddenly the idea sort of struck me that you, you could. You could do it just using regular PGP. You could just get somebody to ha host a key signing party at a commercial venue, and you could witness the creation of a PGP key. And then you could cr generate a document, and you can see here you, you put the, the PGP uh, fingerprint. You put the timestamp, just as I, I mentioned there with the block height and the, the Merkle root. And then you put the, the corresponding hash into the blockchain, and voila. Now you have proof that this document was created in this state at this time. If you try tampering with the document, it will show up, so long as you have the hash and the original document to verify it with. No one can forge this passport. Now, I was later told that these things, these passports, these old-fashioned ones, on paper do apparently use public key infrastructure. But as I started doing more reading, what I realized principally was, well, one, they're not voluntary. You, you have to have one. Number two, the reason they give you this closed source proprietary document is not so that you can travel and be free. They give it to you so that the foreign country that you go to knows where to send you back to. It's a what's known as cover your ass document, okay? When you're born, you're given, a, part, uh, you're given a, a birth certificate. A birth certificate is essentially a financial security. It goes on to an asset list, and then the country of origin can borrow money against your existence. But later on, if you want to leave the territory, you need to apply for a cover your ass document. And when I went through customs on the way here, when I went through passport control, what they do, I found out why they did this. They, they look at you. They look at the thing, they do a basic sanity check. 
and then they put it into a scanner and I never knew what they were doing I, could, I didn't work it out so in theory there is a central database not distributed, centralised worse than Facebook I imagine uh, somewhere at HQ that has a copy of what this passport looked like when it was created they then use a very very poor private proprietary version of public key infrastructure but they don't verify it at the point of presence they don't check the passport's validity there and then unless your passport's been flagged up by Interpol and I've been hearing anecdotally since I started this project of people telling me that they've gone in and out of the USA several times even though they're actually not allowed to and it's because the same modus operandi that Snowden made us aware of with the NSA that basic modus operandi is to just collect as much data as possible and check it later if there's a problem so they scan it in, that then goes into another database, but it's not cross-checked unless there's a problem later on. And this is why the, the UK government has recently announced the decommissioning of the passport office. Yes, you heard me correctly. The UK government decommissioned the, the, the UK passport office because they're no longer fit for purpose. Because they're centralised. That gives them huge overheads. They've got too many people wanting to come over the border and not enough decentralised... Uh, tools to be able to cope with it. So I wanted to create this tool, but there's there's more to it than this. There's 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 a much deeper philosophical point that I'm trying to make here, which is that people have to get better at key management. This is actually about educating people. Now in ancient Greece, you know the the dialogue came up. You have the the sophos and the demos, the experts and the people. Demos means people. It also does the pejorative, the hoi polloi. The, the, the pejorative was that, you know, this is the, the, the idiots, the everyone. And what you risk is a division where the experts go off and become ever more specialised in their fields and they leave everyone else behind such that you end up with this kind of warfare where as the experts get smarter and smarter, it then creates an aristocracy that then hires the elites to create software to control the populace, which is exactly where we are now. You've got the specialists, the aristocracy, and I'm talking about venture capitalists, I'm talking about angel investors, I'm talking about instituted wealth, and then you've got the people. Now, my preferred term for the people is the potentialites, i.e. the people that are, you know, yet to, to, to realise their potential. I don't want to, to, to use the pejorative. And so the question was, not only could we give people an open source set of tools, but could we actually help them understand this technology root and branch, actually give them full control, so that the tools don't control them, so that they could pick up this set of tools and actually understand what this technology is doing which is not what you get currently with Facebook. What you get with Facebook, and I did a, a check just before I came up here, if you type in how to hack Facebook password, there's actually a number of websites that will tell you how to do it because there are enough experts that are mercenary enough to go find out, or perhaps they work for Facebook and they have some, in, some insider knowledge, and you can buy things called rainbow lists where you can actually buy a database of passwords. I found out that one of the most popular passwords used on Facebook in the United Kingdom is Arsenal. Right, And of course, once you start to take on another person's identity, that gives you an incredible amount of power. People are being left behind. We're sleepwalking our way into a future because the experts have got all the knowledge and the wealthy have access to the experts. So this is why we need distributed databases with state transition rules, i.e. a condition on which you can transition the state of a database that isn't dependent on how rich you are. It depends on whether or not you own the key. And that key, the key, and the, the key that we're using in, in this passport service, which is using OpenPGP, as well as the key that you actually use in Bitcoin itself, was issued to you by the universe. <coughs> the universe witnessed the creation of that key. And everyone, governments, aristocrats, the people and all, are all answerable to the universe. Not one single person lives without being at the mercy of nature. We all do. And so this is one of the reasons why I think that not only, uh, I, I don't go in for you know, this whole debate at the moment about regulation. I think the whole thing is a big non sequitur. You're just missing the point in a massive way. We are in a race with education and catastrophe. These tools didn't emerge by accident. They emerged for a reason. They emerged because 
they were necessary to emerge. And the problem is people are still using terrible passport systems, they're still using terrible uh, key management, and they need our help. And there's, you know, you've got an option. When you're an expert and you're privileged, you, you can face someone beneath you in two ways. You can either use your knowledge to help them up and inspire them to learn more, or you can use your knowledge to keep them down. And ethically, morally, I have to go with the, you know, I have to go with the former. Um, so that's why I did it. And I, I did some other things as well. So we did, uh, did actually do a live demonstration. That, that video there will take you to. We actually show people. So within a few days of, of this idea realizing itself in my mind, I went off and I actually created it. I laid out the apparatus. I challenged other people to find holes in it. Because one of, one of the reasons why we're, we're telling people to do it in a commercial venue, of course, is that a commercial venue has a vested interest in publishing their location. You're not violating anyone's privacy. right? So the, the, the actual location where you're issuing these passports are more than happy to say, yes, this is me, this is my IP address, and this is where I am. And then you have a whole database of yellow pages, yelp.com, Google Maps, to be able to verify that location. One of the biggest challenges at the moment in academia with point of presence, that means proving a location, is that all the academics are focusing on proving spatial dimension. That is a mistake because the, the problem with proving space with GPS is GPS, first of all, is a read-only medium. You can easily fake it. But in order to get to space, you have to go through place. You have to go through the community. You have to go through, you know, if you think about what, what is space, let's, let's do that. What is space? Well, space is just the same in every direction. It's just a pure undifferentiation. Place, in contrast, is very, very different. It is defined by its differentiation. It's defined by its hierarchy. It's defined by, you know, this pub over here is better than that pub over there. And you've got this local business owned by Joe, you know, and Joe's been around for, for decades and, 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 and his family. So if you could prove the place, if you could give any third party uh, non-present witness, someone later on coming back, could you give them enough tools to independently verify for themselves that this place existed, that this person existed in this place at this time and no other? And if yes, then, then you had proof of existence in a document that was unforgeable. And I, it's not only, you know, passport. I'm deliberately, by the way, using ambiguous terms. I'm deliberately using terms like passport, world citizenship, because I want people to find the best language to, to suit the case. I don't want to be too prescriptive with it. I actually see the use cases for this being fairly broad reaching, like you could use it for just signing up to like the, the edu room in here, right? You could just have your own key sitting on your own device and you could just log into the Wi-Fi everywhere you went. And of course, you would own your own key. You wouldn't be at the mercy of Facebook having its database corrupted because you would have the private key on your device. You would own it and you would be responsible for it. And that's what the PGP key looked like. So Yanina was very brave. She uh, offered, she was just the first person. We were in a meetup in London and she just said, I'll do it. And I was like, great, get your laptop, create PGP key in front of me. And she did. So I like people with gumption. I like people that just go out and do things. And uh, Actually, one of the interesting things that came up was that nowadays people don't have root access to their computers and devices anymore. So she was using a netbook, which meant that she couldn't install software natively. She was dependent on Google. Um, as a result, she was able to create a PGP key, but the PGP key necessarily has to reside in the cloud, kind of undermining the whole point. So there's still a lot of work to do. And, and actually, by having this kind of honest assessment, and, and by making myself accountable to everyone by publishing as early as possible, all of these things, all these flaws start to show up. And, and as I, since I've been going to cryptographers, some of them, you know, very well respected in the community, a lot of them have been coming back to me and saying, wow, actually, we'd taken this completely for granted because we're the experts. And, and we didn't see that as being a problem because it's not the problem for me. So I didn't anticipate anyone else doing it. And that's not something that we can afford to do. Taylor Swift. I'm going to finish up here. So this is one of the things that Taylor says that she's scared of, which is the machine apocalypse. As the bulbs flash, I can't help but think of cyber war, when the arcing death of electric transformers will light the night, leaving our nation in darkness. So Taylor's premonition and her fear is that the machines will take over us that they'll start crowdfunding themselves and their agendas with Bitcoin wallets, that they'll have the machinery and the mechanization to go to war with us, 
and they will have a database of people and a database of faces and they will know how to identify us and they will come after us and kill us because we all deserve to die. And I don't see that as being the biggest threat. I think the biggest threat is that we become the machines. We start acting automatically. We start becoming predictable. Because the more you change, the harder it is to manipulate your actions. And at the moment, I think the biggest concern is that the people aren't changing quickly enough because the experts, experts are not educating enough. They're not lowering themselves down to the level of the, of the everyday human, and they're not raising them up. So that was my message. I mean, this is not finished. In fact, this is just the beginning. As I said, you can go to um, the GitHub here. It's uh, called FOSSA-2014. I'm Mr. Chris J on GitHub, and you can see it. And in fact, you can, you can go back in time uh, through the Git commit history, and you can see all the changes that I've made throughout. I think I made the commit nine days ago, actually, Stefan, when you first contacted me. And uh, I've put also, I've put all my assumptions in there. So every, th every claim that I've made in this presentation, as I was going through and I was putting down the narrative and I was, you know, taking all my notes, I wrote down, well, what is the assumption behind this claim? And I made a list here. So you can see all the assumptions that I've made, all the premises, like, okay, I'll just show you this one. So I'm defining, when I'm talking about these businesses and these commercial entities, I'm, I'm defining an entrepreneur as someone that has the ability to anticipate demand, that when they behave well, they have the ability to de-risk an uncertain environment for another who may not share the same concerns, right? So if I, not, I can't train to be a carpenter, so I hire a carpenter to do the woodwork in my house. And that's perfectly okay that I can have a society with a division of concerns or a separation of concerns, to borrow the term from computer science, and that I can start to lease out some of that expertise I'm then defining a business uh, as nothing more than a sequence of activities. It's just a group of people coming together and agreeing on a sequence of events in time. I'm defining profit very loosely. So if I mention the word profit in the presentation, I'm just defining it as progress. It doesn't have to be financial profit. In fact, one way to understand where I'm coming from on this is that I, I'm, I'm greedy, but I'm greedy for a different type of profit. It's not a financial profit. It's much more long-term than that. It's got something to do with humans become understanding our humanity and humans becoming the stewards of nature because nature doesn't nature doesn't have this sequence building ability does it it doesn't have the ability to, to make plans it just as aristotle said he describes it as phusis it's just it's just it has its own momentum it has its own energy it's predetermined Whereas the human is defined by their ability to care, by their ability to form sequences. We're defined by the gaps, the things that we miss out, the things that we don't do, um, the people that we overlook when we tell stories about history. Our history and our timelines are defined by the bits that we leave and that we don't include. Because otherwise, if you, if you had a history that included everything, well, then that's just the universe, isn't it? All right. So this, this, these are some of my premises. So you could please, please do fork it. Don't just you know, leave it. If you, if you disagree with anything, please make it known for the record. You can come here, you can fork it, you can download my text file and make changes. And then we can all have this debate uh, together. So with that, I thank you very much for your time and your attention. And please feel free to ask any questions if we have time. We have time, apparently. Aha! Yeah, Thank you. No Merci. Hello, um, I'm Benoit Domoni. What about, uh, what do you think about uh, cryptography and quantum uh, computing, for instance, or increased uh, power computing? Yeah. So um, remember I started this debate by saying that I'm just, a, I'm just a regular person, so I don't claim to be an expert. My view, are you talking about quantum computing in relation to Bitcoin and the mining algorithm? Sorry, where are you, by the way? I can just hear this voice coming from. Ah. 
So are you talking about uh, the, uh, the quantum computing in relation to Bitcoin specifically or generally? Yeah, I probably don't know it well enough to talk about it in general terms, but in terms of its impact on, on Bitcoin, one of the things that, of course, it does is it doubles the key length, right, which effectively halves the, the, the strength of the ciphers that we're using in the Bitcoin mining, which means that we'll then need quantum encryption, right, to offset against the advantage that you would get from quantum cryptography. So I think that in terms of the mining and the incentive structure, that we have in Bitcoin. It's an academic question, and it would be a question of uh, which, how many experts can you recruit and for which side, right? I actually don't think that in, when it comes to hacking that the, the hackers are necessarily the bad guys. I think they actually help to keep the rest of us honest by learning at the, at the fastest possible pace because, of course, a criminal is incentivized, um, has massive profit margins, you know, in organized crime, uh, to go off and be knowledgeable. And then it tests the good people, the good people that want to use the technology in ways that are positive to keep up a pace with them. I actually think that the real bad people are the people that just sit on the sidelines and, and, and don't take too much attention. So that, that's about as, as much of an educated answer that I'm qualified to give you. Anyone else? Any question? Hello. Uh, I'm not a technical expert about things uh, concerning cryptography, but uh, I think your talk is very interesting, especially uh, concerning things like the uh, world citizenship passport. Um, uh, for example, uh, I'm working now with uh, many people uh, in, um, in the Fab Lab here in Rennes, and uh, uh, one of um, the very interesting things is that when the people are simply using concrete objects connected objects, what is very interesting is that they are asking questions about how does it work. Mm -hmm. And they are beginning to understand whether what is in the black boxes they are using every day, and uh, beginning to understand why perhaps they could try to breed together uh, other things or to help uh, open source projects. So um, um, it's, a, it's just a question. Um, when I see the, I don't know with the good accent, apparatus, apparatus, Yes. Um, with the two computers, with the PGP key when, and with the tools, uh, immediately I, I think to myself, in f perhaps we could uh, invent uh, some uh, very uh, tangible interfaces that make some places able to register every people who would be interested to play the game in order both to explain to the people who don't know anything about what is a key and what is happening every day uh, what is happening in the boxes in the network between the peers and uh, uh, to uh, make the, um, the project and I see this kind of dynamic in your project of being a uh, project not only technical but an adventure uh, coll collective adventure to we um, people uh, want to play with it and to make things and I think it's very important to have this dimension to make the, the project work especially not only technical, but uh, the projects. And uh, I think perhaps it would be very interesting to imagine what we could build with tangible objects, open source objects, mm -hmm. to uh, make a kind of funny uh, registering places where we could uh, say to the people, hey, today is a citizen day, you can, make, you can come and we are going to register uh, some uh, world citizens and uh, perhaps we could use uh, plexi um, plexiglass glasses where to explain to the people with LEDs what is happening when the keys. And I think it would be something who could be very useful physically uh, to uh, develop this kind of, uh, of project. And I think many places like Hackerspace and Fab Labs would be interested to, to work on this. And I want to know if you think it, it could be interesting. Oh, thank you very much. You've made a lot of very good points. And uh, one of them is uh, this sort of line that I've been banding around recently, which is you, that you're not really free if your freedom depends on the slavery of other people. And one of the things that really defines what we're going through at this period of history is that we have the big picture now. 
we can see further back into time, we can see more across geospatial boundaries, and it makes us responsible. We are responsible, as in we have the ability to respond to this, this charge, I think, that comes to us from our conscience, which is, okay, now that we have these tools, how do we help people understand them? And I think it starts with why. People have to buy into why. They have to understand, look, the reason why it's important for you to come to this hackathon and to build this stuff out of physical tools, you know, the kind that you can see, right, with your eyes and not the stuff that goes on on some cloud server, you know, in, in San Francisco or probably India, right, is that it's under your domicility, it's in your proximity, and you are therefore in charge of it, right? Freedom begins with security. It begins with what is right here and under my jurisdiction. And you are essentially giving that away when you go onto Facebook and let them manage your keys. And so absolutely, and um, I'm working on another project at the moment using something called surveyors polls. You know what they are? Surveyors use them to map out borders. It comes from the Tudors, I've been told, that you when you register some land, the deeds for the land, you have to say where it is, right? So you use these poles, and they've got GNSS in them, it's a new form of GPS, and it pings the, the satellites, takes about six hours, and then it gives you a geographic coordinate for these four poles in the ground. And I was saying, well, we could do this, we could do this with a blockchain. You could put a Raspberry Pi in one of these things, seal it up, and you could execute the code, you could have compiled code, and you could just say, right, generate your own wallet, announce your existence on the blockchain, and then everyone that's present in the surveying process can just send the instructions over the blockchain in public, in full view, and say, where are you? And then the poll replies back, I'm here. And now everyone gets to be a witness to that surveying. So when there are disputes, because think about what the legal system is right now. It's just a cacophony of claims and counterclaims. I own this, you own this. And because everyone's at very different levels in their personal development, because not everyone is on the same page in terms of their education, in terms of their finance, it causes dispute. And what that does is it creates, well, a world with zero justice, because you can't just have a world where justice for the rich, I would say, you can afford a, a surveyor and you can afford a lawyer to sign the deeds. Well, yes, but what if you can't afford it? Well, then there's no justice. Well, if, if there's only justice for the rich, then really what you're saying is there is no justice. Yes, because that's not justice then, is it? You, you're only really securing it. So absolutely, you need to help people understand this stuff at the visceral, physical layer that's why, and if you're a developer, by the way, you probably looked at this and said, but Chris, why are, you, why are you generating an image file and hashing the image file? This could be headless by design, right? You could just create a JSON and, uh, you know, and just put it in the JSON file, and then you've got the presentation layer, you know, the, the bit of CSS that makes it look pretty on the top. And of course, I'm aware of that. But the reason I'm, I'm not just automatically telling people to, to do it that way is because it obscures something important about this which is that if you if you just make it look pretty and you automate away all the pain points i'm using terms that are actually used in startups today you are essentially treating the user like an ignorant person you're you're obscuring the complexity underneath and then they don't understand how it works so one of the ways i and you didn't ask me this but i think it was implied in your question one of the ways i get around the virtual nature of a lot of these tools is by making it visible. So actually getting them to put the Merkel root into the graphic. Yes, of course, as, we, as developers, we understand you didn't need to do that, of course. You could have just concatenated the Merkel root with the hash of the PGP signature and put the combined hash into the blockchain. Yes, I understand. I know you can automate it away. I'm just, remember that one of the key objectives here is to help people understand the underlying technology, and you don't do that by automating it away. Because then, well, how do you know how to get back to the resulting hash? Well, you only know if you read the code. Well, I'm sorry, but how many people read code? Like, there are probably just a few hundred people that even subscribe to the Bitcoin developer mailing list, maximum. And I wonder how many of them, as a percentage, even read it. You are letting these technorati class of elite experts just steamroller our way into a future. They're executing all of these policies into the code. They're basically baking their ethics into the physics of the universe because they are defining an experience for you in the future. That's what they're doing. They're baking it into the protocol, proto, the emphasis, of course, the French etymology, <laughs> I don't need to explain this, but the proto, the emphasis is on proto, beforehand, prior to, yes? 
you're defining this is how we do things before we get started, which, as I said at the beginning, is diametrically opposed to the system we have now, which is post hoc rationalised. Let's wait for the crime to be committed first and then let's go and solve it later, rather than making it preventative by design. So, yeah, absolutely. I want to see more people do this. And I don't want this sort of nightmare scenario of millions of people getting their accounts hacked, getting their... I think what people fear the most is actually having their... That having their identity taken is a very frightening thing. And I know a number of people that have had their Twitter accounts hacked and had someone masquerade as them. And it's, it's a very unpleasant experience. It's a very existential, existentially disturbing experience because all your friends are suddenly led to believe that you're someone that you're not. And then you've got to go and you've got to apologise. And you feel like apologising, right? Because you were that referent. You were that image. You were that icon. And you end up apologising for the behaviour of a hacker. And I think if you make that very real to people, particularly you know, with people like, uh, I don't, I'm not clued up on these things, but I hear Jennifer Lawrence had her phone hacked. I hear it was very humiliating and embarrassing for her. And this is the reason why. The reason that happened was because she entered into a legal agreement with Apple Corporation that may as well have been Mein Kampf. She wouldn't read it because nobody reads those damn things. They just see that the terms come up and she goes, yeah, okay, yeah, sure, you can take all my personal information, check my GPS data, take all my nude pictures, sure, no problem. And she unwittingly entered into an agreement that she fundamentally didn't understand. And it's this, it's this opportunity cost, or I don't know what it is amongst lawyers and, and, and developers. They just, oh, we don't have time for that. We don't have time to educate the user. They're too dumb. They don't, they don't want to learn. And so... And as a result, that's why you end up with all of these problems. And what I'm saying is I don't want us to do what we've done throughout history as a species, which is leave it until the brink, until we decide it's a good idea to turn around. I'd rather, like you say, your suggestion, absolutely perfect. Get people engaged now at these, these hackathons. Because the last someone sent me an email last night, and I'm not even kidding, that they just come back from a hackathon where their idea of you know, good experimental code was to create nipple tassels out of Bitcoin, physical Bitcoins. Like, I'm not even kidding. Kidding. This was the best idea that they could come up with. And the reason is that whoever pays the piper picks the tune. Who's paying for these hackathons at the moment? It's VC. It's the aristocracy. It's the, it's the VCs. They want to put money in one end, get more money out the next. They don't care about the underlying fundamentals. Some of them do, but most of them don't. So when you go to these hackathons, particularly Bitcoin-related ones, it's a PR stunt. These people are competing to stay relevant. Right? They want to look like they're cool. This, this could be bathroom tiles. It doesn't have to be Bitcoin. It just happens to be Bitcoin right now. But they're opportunistic by nature. And so they go in and they say, right, we really like Bitcoin and we really like the politics, you know, the open source code. It's all really, really great. Could you make it for us? Could it, could, it, could it be Lloyd's coin? Could it be RBS coin? Could it be Barclays coin? We really like it, but not all the stuff that's good about it. If you could just give us the powerful stuff and we can rebrand it and recast it. And because the majority, the demos haven't heard of it yet because they're too busy going about their daily lives not everyone knows how to be a carpenter then what they hear at the end is the big marketing push they they see the barclays coin but they they don't know about bitcoin because they just weren't paying attention and so you can't have this system that sorry to go on but can i just i don't want to belabor this point but when i flew here i i walked in through the doors of the plane and i thought thank god that pilot is actually qualified for the job. Thank God that pilot wasn't just good at getting the job. Thank God he didn't blag his way in. Thank God the HR, the Human Resources Department of British Airways, knows how to recruit good quality pilots. In other words, he wasn't just good at marketing. He wasn't just good at swindling a good story on his CV. He actually, presumably, was good at flying a plane. And I was grateful that that was a process that he had to go through before flying me here. So you see what I mean? You, you do still have a responsibility to make sure that the people that are financing these events in the first place, are, their incentives are aligned with the outcome that we all want. Because I, at the end, you'll get the behavior you design for, right? You'll get whatever, you, you know, whatever ethics, whatever values you had instilled in you when, it, when you thought it was a good idea to put on a hackathon. So thank you for making such a great point. Any other question? Yeah, no? So we do a short debate, mm -hmm. don't worry, and after we have a cocktail where we can all speak together. I think that's a very interesting part. Thank you Drinking. very much for that. Thank you very much for the opportunity as well. No, no, don't worry. It was a great talk. <laughs>